Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is a regularly scheduled summer meeting of the Sunderland Select Board of Awesome. We're going to call to order at 6.30. Hey, you have not, look it. you got the man in the back room. He's right in the back. He's confused. Yeah, we, we had to change our name so we could do inject whatever name we want, right? So that said, uh, tonight we've got uh, David not with us, so we're going to postpone at least one vote tonight because there's an active discussion around uh, input around that particular item that had to do with uh, wood-derived biomass uh, as part of our energy plan. And I think David's uh, role in this is important. So we're going to postpone that for another another meeting. We got Joel Mollison. You're not from Goshen, are you? I am. No way. You know a guy named David Mollison? Second cousin. Nice. I went to school with David. He's going to hear from Northeast IT. He's going to tell us all about our base assessment, about why we have to get off of DOS. Sherry doesn't like backslash, <laughs> slash, slash, backslash anymore. I like DOS. <laughs> DOS was pretty predictable, though. Well, you knew where you were going. Exactly right. That leads to a joke that's inappropriate for the air, so we won't go there. Uh, Chris Collins is going to be in tonight to talk to us about peg access funding. If anybody has paid attention, notice that the FCC is going to begin starting putting things out that effectively is going to rob the public of its voice, in at least potential. Uh, we've got a little bit of work uh, from uh, the folks over at... Uh, Sugarbush Meadow and Rich is going to come in. Rich Brenda, uh, operator of our treatment plant, uh, chief engineer, and talk. We'll exchange some discussion we had with the developer, and then uh, we'll talk about the School Street ADA project, which uh, Sherry's been working on. The Capital Planning Committee was in a week ago or two, maybe a week ago, a week ago because it was our off meeting. Talked about where. Uh, those elements can be played out in capital. And I think this is an important discussion because we have, uh, we're digesting now a, an ADA uh, review and suggestions that have come from a uh, review by the COG, which is really comprehensive, and frankly, we did pretty well on. Uh, and these, in, these uh, elements were not necessarily part of that uh, review, but are available for some uh, grant rounding. So. Okay, straight up, Joel Mollison, second cousin of David Mollison, Northeast IT, <laughs> is going to talk to us about assessments and improvements in the house. This is a byproduct of a survey and then an RFQ for services, correct? And a, an IT technology grant that the town was awarded under Got the it. state IT um, technology grant program. Okay, before you get started, do you have anything? I don't want to exclude you. No, I'm just here for a ride. <laughs> That means he's going to be wordy at the end. It'd be all good. I okay. don't know. I didn't know no Mollisons from Goshen, but Mollisons. I feel. Live, I feel kind of feel left off. Of Mollisons live near Lovins. And that's I important know. to bear in mind. <laughs> I'm going to have to get out more often. <laughs> Come back home from Maine. But seriously, do you have anything you want to add at the beginning? Okay, great. So, how do we do on our assessment, and how much is it going to cost us? Well, uh, of just to back up a little bit, yeah. the RFQ process we kind of put in a bid based on. The size and scope of the town versus other towns that we'd worked with in the past and yep. we worked with several um, and a lot of it was some guesswork and then the part of that was to come in and do an actual assessment to finalize where we were actually at mm -hmm. um, i can tell you that the assessment turned up a few things that we were kind of surprised to see there's some there's a lack of just general best practices mm -hmm. Um, some of the things are just very simple things like password complexity. Uh, there were some other serious, more serious issues like lack of antivirus on some of the systems, a general lack of backup across the board unless it was being done by individuals within their own department. There was no automation, there were no cross checks. Um, if you were to get a serious virus inside this network, like a ransomware virus, you would probably lose 80 to 90% of your data with no recovery option other than to pay the ransom. Yeah, we've been there. Right, you've been we, there. We did not pay well, the ransom. Well, you've been there and you also lost your email server, we as did. I'm aware, Correct. last year. Yep. So you were very much in that similar predicament across the board on all your systems. Mm -hmm. um, we put together a comprehensive plan basically to cover all these things. So it's going to be a new physical server, virtual servers. We're going to retain some of the prior servers for reference only. Um, but basically, we're going to rebuild the network almost from the ground up internally. Um, one of the big points that we found was a lot of the data was stored not on the server but on individual workstations mm. um, and we don't know why that was we were told that there were some trust issues some things that had happened in the past by people who were not storing things on the server the problem with that becomes that every system becomes an independent island in terms of backup and maintenance and monitoring 
we're going to consolidate everything. We're going to redirect files to be on a server, siloed there so we can have a more simplistic backup system. Um, so basically we're covering just about every aspect of the network to some degree. Um, a lot of the equipment we're going to retain. Uh, some of it is fine in terms of age and uh, utilization yeah. you know, for the foreseeable near future, next few years. Um, the server is estimated to last at least five years out of the gate, and then we kind of see where the technology changes at that point. Most of the time, people are replacing servers in year six. Yep. So that's kind of the gist of it. Um, in terms of the overall uh, bid process, I believe we were somewhere in the $24,000 range. Mm -hmm. um, due to the assessment, we had to recalculate how we were doing some things. So we actually added some hardware, added some software, um, but there was some changes in terms of pricing out there and we're able to utilize some of the equipment we didn't think we were going to. So basically it became an offset and I sent uh, Sherry a proposal today and it's very much where it was, I think, right? It is. There are two caveats. One is the assessor's uh, server needs to be upgraded and then basically it only uh, benefits their department. Mm -hmm. um, they need to upgrade their software. There's a separate like kind of sub project with that. Okay. Um, there's also the, um, Sherry, the software Abila, is that the? Abila, that's Abila. our accounting program. The accounting program. Um, the intent was for all departments to use that, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. That's a goal. And yeah. it has been reported that that has not been the case. Um, I did a significant amount of legwork today, and I talked to Avila and their technical support people. I also found that there was various versions on different machines, so things weren't lining up. Um, we're going to be able to realize the software as it is now, but it's only supported until 2022 okay. under the current uh, construct of what we have for software and um, all the requirements that go with it, and then you will have to invest about $3,500 to update. That makes sense. I do have that as a separate proposal that I will send to Sherry that I was trying to finalize today, but I was unable to do so before arriving tonight. Um, the second larger issue is that you probably are unaware that <coughs> Microsoft is discontinuing the support of a number of software packages in January. So Windows 7 is going to go away. Um, there's uh, Server 2008 is going to go away, which is one of your servers you have now. The larger problem is the Windows 7. You have a significant number of machines that are still running Windows 7. Huh. And we do not have an upgrade plan, although we've started one. Uh, I gave Sherry some preliminary numbers. I believe it was about between labor. Th there was some variance because it depends on what you want to do. So some of the machines I felt were viable. We could just update them and upgrade them and keep mm -hmm. them. And the others were full-on replacements because the cost of the labor and parts Weren't, it wasn't a realization that was possible. So that would be a purchase and then migrate. Right, purchase and migrate. So that's going to, in a perfect world, would we do that in conjunction with this server project? Because right. as we change out the servers and put the servers in place, we need to join the new workstations to the servers Sorry. and to not repeat labor by putting the old servers or the old systems on the new server yep. and then replacing. We would want to do that along the line. The problem is the number comes out to about $9,500, give or take. So I don't know if that's in the budget. I don't know what's available. That's something we have to discuss as we move forward. So I'm hearing something along there that is potentially a phase, right? It's a phase, but it's mixed, right? So it's separate from the original RFQ. Yeah. But this is these are things that we're going to have to adjust by every single individual user and department. So we have to go through their computers, see what software they're running, and then we have to have a plan for each individual uh, machine, it's, it's which a we, have, we have started at this point, yep. um, but we'll probably need to d uh, speak with the individual departments to make sure that we haven't missed anything, mm -hmm. um, and then go from there. And again, I would like to blend that with the server project. Um, in terms of server project timeline, uh, I know that we were given until January. Mm -hmm. We just don't want to do that. We have a numerous amount of clients that are doing the same project. Uh, you have no backup systems. You have no antivirus. There's no point in putting in a stopgap at this point. Sure. It's just, we should just move forward. Mm -hmm. um, if we're able to get everything finalized in terms of the purchase for at least the server, we can start that process. Um, and then we can mix in the PCs as the money's available, if it's available. Um, and again, we can review that at a department level and see which ones really, I mean, honestly, they all should be changed out. But if we have to extend it, um, then we just take our chance at extending. It's not that the computers are gonna stop working, it's just that they're no longer supported, so security measures, yeah. other things, uh, compatibility of software down the road may become a problem. Yeah, the biggest um, cost is covered by the grant. Sure. Um, so, and then um, some of the other stuff can be addressed in the technology line yep. and in the capital um, line. Sense. 
and then going forward we'll have a capital plan for technology because we'll have right. a lifespan for the equipment and and that's um, the intent is at some point usually when we're working with our clients we lay out a budgetary timeline with a okay. capital replacement schedule so you can actually give it to your finance committee and you'll see the year over year Makes sense. Uh, there will be some additional add-ons for that with the software mm -hmm. the software has Support. different ebbs and flows depending on which uh, software packages you're on and that's something we have to iron out but we're still kind of we're learning as we go and the more that we dig into the server project the more that we're going to know and by the time we're finished we'll have all the information required to help you guys get a real plan together the monthly the recurring costs yeah that we'll have to budget for in the Spending operating expenses, right? yeah. Tom, questions, things that jump out? Um, I, I actually thought that we were, everything was being backed up. I was kind of surprised to hear it wasn't. There were remnants of a previous backup system um, on some of the system, like on some of the servers, um, but it does not exist. I believe it goes back to IT people ago. And then there was a, somebody had set something up on an external drive, but it has not run in almost a year. So it was started, but it, Hmm. didn't continue for whatever reason it wasn't monitored etc i think there's a training component too that some of the um, departments aren't sure actually how to back up onto the server or well, what needs to go most, on the server so <laughs> most departments wouldn't have the administrative authority to go into the backup system on that because that would make them be able to cross over into department data that's not theirs typically this is something that's managed by the it people mm -hmm. uh, right now we've actually signed a agreement with you guys to monitor and maintain your systems for the next year mm -hmm. um, and as part of that once all the stuff is up we will be monitoring this on a monthly basis your antivirus your backups um, your backup system will back up daily we will be monitoring them weekly to make sure they've happened and we'll also be loading those files to make sure they're valid and usable if need be so that's all part of the maintenance agreement which is we just haven't been able to do that because there's nothing in place yet right And there's some detailed notes in the back of the report yeah. when you can get it down to a more granular level. But I didn't want to go crazy because yeah, no. this is all going to be changed out. It's all about the small black boxes that sit there and hum along. <laughs> <laughs> so is there going to be a fair amount of disruption with the... Uh, this migration, if you will, or this up series of upgrades, not a full on migration, but. Well, there will be some minimized disruption, mm -hmm. but it's gonna be very minor. Um, the way that we usually approach these types of projects is we get the new servers prepped and set up. Yep. We bring them in here, we actually install them downstairs in the rack, yep. and then we one at a time start moving the applications from one server to the other, okay. working with the outsourced vendors. Um, and that's, that happens over a period of weeks, typically, sure. because we have to uh, coordinate with them. There's a lot going on. We have to coordinate with the departments inside mm -hmm. to make sure we're not going to be affecting them. So that'll happen over a number of weeks. And mm -hmm. then as soon as that's wrapped up, we take the old servers offline, and pretty much everybody gets moved. We move the data usually at night. It's all scripted, so there's really limited interruption. And even if we are interrupting folks, you guys are not open on Friday, is my understanding. Right. So we'll be trying to schedule most of those moves on Friday. Right. So then by Monday, we'll have people on standby ready to answer questions or help folks that have things that are missing. So it should be pretty minimalized. And what's your effective start date? Um, I did put in the report. I don't know if you have it. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to get everything approved by this Friday. That way we can order the component parts because there's about a two and a half week lead time on right. getting the servers and equipment. We have another week of prep and we have to get things here and then start that several week process of getting through this. I would like to be done with this completely by October mm -hmm. um, would be my goal. Um, right. Whether or not we can infuse those PC replacements by that date, I'm not sure. Maybe that's kind of something that hangs off to the side. Um, you know, and again, there's a few, like I know the assessors are gonna need a new PC as part of this because they're getting new software. It just has to happen and all together um, simultaneously. But the other departments are a little bit more flexible at this point. And the assessors will be going last because they want to wait until after the tax bills are out before they do it. I was going to ask about accounting <laughs> software and closing of books and monthly closures and that kind of stuff. And that, in that sense, it should be relatively seamless because you're talking about essentially the server that holds that. Mm -hmm. 
So the software, they're going to be able to walk in and still go about yeah, their business. Yeah, everything's going to work. Yeah. So the assessors are in a weird position because they are running a multi-version old system. Yeah. And now they have to be brought up to date that it requires the new server. Yeah. It requires new software. Right. And Patriot Systems is who they're using. It actually has to take the database and then convert it to the new style and then re-inject it. That doesn't so sound like it'll be anything but is, seamless. Well, <laughs> Hopefully, Hopefully, in most cases it is, as long as we check and verify data when we start and then right. when it goes back right. to make sure it's right. correct. We actually had that problem with another community who yep. didn't check the data when it got back and they worked on the wrong system for two weeks, so. It's all right. We'll, we'll make sure that doesn't happen here. Um, but it should be fairly seamless. They just don't have any way to do any input of data for about four or five days when that's in transition. It's out of our hands. Then, right. Good. Okay. Sure, you want a motion to uh, enter into this agreement? Yes. Motion. So we have a motion made, seconded. This is to enter into an agreement for a uh, response to Northeast IT's uh, summary review and proposal. Looks like it's $21,932.95, $21,932.95. And it will get us one month closer to the 21st century. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Two to zero, please. We'll have that signed downstairs for you. Okay. So it's before Friday. You'll finish two days early. I'll scan it and send it over in the morning. I like it. Thank I like you. It. Thank you so much. I appreciate the review. Right. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Have a great night. Okay. It seems like it was just yesterday we did something along this line. But We've been yeah. at it for a couple of years, yeah, so we're hardwired years. now. Uh, and yep. Built that infrastructure well, out. Yeah. Never seems to end. It includes a library, also, right? Yes, everyone. Right. Mm -hmm. That's important because there's a there's an area of, of uh, opportunity for improvement right there. Okay, so we're a little bit late. Let's bring up Chris Collins from FCAT. Talk about peg access funding. Never late to talk to Chris. You listen when Chris talks. You don't talk to Chris. It's been far too long. I'm How are sure. you? How are you tonight? How's it going? Good Hi, Chris. I'm here to talk to you about two issues. One of which you can't do anything about. And one Perfect. of which you probably can't. Uh oh. Uh, the one you can't do anything about happens in this coming Thursday mm -hmm. in Washington. Federal Communications Commission is going to meet, and they're going to take this vote on this rule change that everybody's freaking out about, which related, is related to public access television. In a nutshell, they want to change the rules regarding funding for PEG access. And essentially, they want to be able to allow cable companies to charge public access stations, or communities in this case, for the right to be on their channels. Right now they provide channel space for free. We have three channels, and one for Sunder, one specific 50, and then 12 and 23, which are on all four, on all four towns. They want to charge the cost of providing that service against the 5% franchise fee that you negotiated in your last contract. No one is quite sure what this means in terms of direct impact on PEG access service vis-a-vis -vis the dollar number you get from Comcast in terms of the money coming in. However, last week I was in a meeting in Conway where they were negotiating their new contract. Bill Solomon was there, the guy who negotiated your current contract. Mm -hmm. And he said that because you guys negotiated at a lower percentage, instead of the full five, you got 4.8 percent, it's possible that the impact, and there will be an impact, won't be as bad as we think. So in a way, negotiating for less of a percentage may have been a beneficial hmm. because they're gonna have to go up to 5% and something about, and again, this is lawyer speak, if they, if they have to charge up to 5%, they're gonna lose money in the back end, the Com Comcast is going to lose any kind of money. Right. So there's gonna be a hit, the question is what, how much? That's assuming couple of things that the commission votes for it which is every indication they're going to vote in favor of the rule change but my guess is there's going to be injunctive action in federal court hmm. that the FCC makes this change someone's going to file a temporary injunction in federal court so that may delay the implementation of the change but one of the things we have to do if this happens is and I'm going to depend on you guys to do this is I need you to closely monitor the dollar figure, because every month, every quarter, you guys right. get a, a number figure number from Comcast. We don't get that, by the way, for whatever reason. They don't send it to us. They did once or sure. twice. Can you can you just send sure. it to them? Yeah, pass it yeah. off. Right. And just send Chris, it. you're going to have that now. Good. Thank you. Um, 
And every town, obviously, has a different amount of money they so get. So can I ask you one question? Sure. So we entered into a contract yes. that was negotiated. Yes. So why would, why would they, now you're going to change something? That doesn't, that, well, it does, if you look that in, doesn't if seem. If you look in your contract, you're probably going to find language that says the contract is dependent on FCC rules remaining in effect. The FCC can change any rule they want and anything related to communications, TV, radio, whatever. And it supersedes or negates any other contracts that may exist. So why do we have why do we have a long when you when you sign a long term contract, you're agreeing to the rules that were in place when you signed that contract. I agree. I, I'm not disagreeing. So I, I, I say now, well I don't think I should have to pay my house mortgage any longer, so I'm just such a girl. it doesn't make sense to me. Well, when you're dealing with monopolies, which is what we're dealing with here, because Comcast owns this area, essentially, they can pretty much do whatever they want. Our own bill for our own office went from $234 last month to $330 this month. I have no idea why. We haven't changed a single service. We haven't done anything different. These guys are, are freaking out because people are cutting the cord left and right because of these kinds of tactics, because of this kind of operation, because they aren't an easy company to deal with. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have no choice but to deal with them because they are the cable provider for Sunderland, for Conway, for Deerfield, and for Whaley. Right. So I'm going to keep a close eye on this. We, all, Everybody in the industry is watching this. My guess is that it's not going to have any impact initially or, well, I'm talking on both sides of my mouth here. I don't think, I think someone's going to challenge it if it happens, but it wouldn't surprise me for the, to the cable companies try and deduct that money anyway. Right. Right. Even if it is an injunctive, an injunctive process, in which case we probably have to get Bill Solomon on the line and have to call him on the carpet and say, yo, this isn't in place yet. You're right. going to have to not mess around with our money. Um, it won't affect the capital. It'll affect the operating. Right. And right now you guys give us 12250 a quarter in operating funds. That's the second largest amount we get. Mm -hmm. Deerfield gives us 20000 a quarter. And, and I'm not even going to get into the discussion of what happens if the funding goes away. Do you guys want to think about putting, putting an appropriation in every year? I'm not going to even go there because I still don't. I'm going to believe this when I see it. I think it's going to go to federal court. And by the way, the United States Senate also might have a problem with the FCC flouting federal law that they created. Right. And the U.S. Senate's the only governmental agency in the government that can check the FCC. They did that with net neutrality. That's yep. why net neutrality didn't go away, because yep. the Senate checked them. Yep. Right now, the only one screaming about it is Ed Markey. I don't think he's got a lot of people listening to him. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things where when it goes away, people will notice it. Right. But until then, it's not on anybody's radar, which is one of the things we've been fighting tooth and nail to try and change with appearances on programs like this and, yep. and, and pre-recorded stuff. Hmm. So the worst case scenario is that they, if, if that revenue licensing stream is dropped by whatever percentage it is or back charged, right, an appropriation may be required to keep FCAT at, if, the, if at, you want to keep at the level we're level at now. now. Yep. And the good news is that because of my brilliant budgeting skills, <laughs> we have more than a prudent reserve in there. I haven't, I haven't, brilliant. 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 I haven't, spent, a, I haven't spent a lot of money. I've been very careful though, over the last year not to spend a lot of money. Unfortunately, we've had a ton of stuff go wrong in there. I lost all three of my editors uh, in the same week. You fired them? No, no. I mean the editing stations. Oh, 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 oh. Computers oh. all died. Just checking. You're running so, the camera now. Running yeah. the camera now. The cameras, we've got one editing station that's working. We've got all our cameras are still working. But if you have to do more than one show, you're out of luck. So I've been very careful not to spend money. So we've got more than six months of operating revenue. If the worst case, the absolute worst case scenario is, and we don't know. By You're the way, talking a lot with your hands tonight. Yeah. <laughs> it's just that's that's around, and it's, it's different. Usually, usually, you, usually yeah. yeah, usually you don't talk with your hands. Yeah, well, I, about this issue, I get a very. We're on TV, so it's good. That's People, true. Yeah. We're on TV. Um, the other part of this that's a mystery is we don't know what Comcast is going to assess for a cost. Right. For providing those channels, so we have no idea. They could they could make up any number. Out of, out of I, I know how much. Four <laughs> point four point seven percent right. of yeah, the exactly code. right. I, well, this, not this not the, I've ever been negotiating with it right. before. Well, this but. is the fear, and the funny thing is, we're up there in Conway, and and we're trying to, to negotiate with Conway on technical issues, and I'm thinking to myself, is this even going to be a reality in two years? 
but is there going to be any money to have a contract? Yeah, that's fair. So it's 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 a scary moment for us in the industry. However, I I think that there will be an injunctive action taken that will at least delay this, mm -hmm. and by then maybe we'll get a better idea of what the actual lay of the land is in terms of what we're going to lose for funding. So why don't you tell Conway we're negotiating that to get in cycle with us and we can all do it together like we originally set it out to do? I don't know why that happened. I, I do I, know I can tell you how it happened. You tell me. I don't know. At, at, when, we, when we were doing the, when we do an original negotiations, Reiterate. Whiteley and Conway both, Deerfield and Sunderland were working together. Mm -hmm. and, and Whiteley, because it was all a frontier district, the mm -hmm. Sunderland, Whiteley, Deerfield were negotiating together because that's, that's the reason we got because of our union school district. Right. Conway, because at that time they really weren't being served. They were being they had some people coming from Ashfield and some people coming from from wherever. Yep. They did, really didn't have anything. But we had already said, say, look, if you ever want, you know, you can join us. And we had written in the original contracts that Conway could be granted into our thing. They never, they never, but they were always welcomed into it so yeah it, it, it was just they didn't at the time they didn't have the numbers but Conway is getting the lesson that the other three towns have gotten in dealing with this company which is they aren't warm and fuzzy to deal with and and you know Conway is the smallest piece of my pie in terms of funding um, but they love the service they love it sure. they love what we do and they want to be able to go live in all their different towns hook it up through fiber and that's all great but if, if, the, if the mechanism for funding access doesn't exist in two years when that contract takes effect, what are you negotiating? Right. I mean, I, and I'm not discouraging a negotiation. What I'm saying is I'm supposed to write an ascertainment and sort of explain where the, where the organization is going. I don't know if the organization is going to be alive in six to eight months. Right. So it's, it's, it's a scary thing, but it's also I'm just glad it's going to finally be, I think, decided and we have a better idea of where we are moving forward. Like I said, I've been preparing for this for... 12 months being very careful very prudent you know spending only money all of our money that we spend is on 100% almost on production we don't buy a lot of tchotchkes we don't buy a lot of sets we don't do any of that stuff because no. you don't know where the money's going to be and, sure? and I don't want to have to worry about us not being solvent I mean I, I don't, don't want to be the director that I get dies on my watch so we're going to stay in, in business as long as we can I worry about the kids that work for us because um, they do really hard work. They're, they're really good. They're very talented, and I don't want to lose anybody. Right. But I'm going to have to go where the numbers tell me to go. So it's entirely possible we're going to have to have a meeting in the next few months and figure out what the reality is, if, if there's any change in the reality. But the more you can do to keep me apprised of what the numbers sure. are that yeah. come in, and I will adjust my, my, uh, my um, bills or my invoices if it does go just, but just so you know Sun, Sunderland I know Deerfield have been big supporters of sure, FCAT yeah. for a long 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 time so. and we appreciate it and, and I mean back in our initial negotiation so probably 15 years ago so hey you let us move more. in here what can I, you know it can't be much more than that in terms of showing support to Tom's point there was a fair amount of discussion in this room and on these cameras about you know that vision that was FCAT and FCAT Phase One, right? Versus FCAT Phase Two versus FCAT currently, and you know, I would uh, I would say certainly from my perspective, sun Saturday night movies aside, which are always a great thing, <laughs> um, you know, FCAT is where I think the initial discussions 15 plus years ago had envisioned FCAT has gotten to, and I think that's a good thing. We had a lot of fun, by the way, at the uh, opening of the park. We have a couple of pr pieces running now, the actual ribbon cutting, yep. and then we have the Neils concert, yep. and John Boshin, our senior producer, is working on a much bigger piece that sort of encompasses everything. Oh, it'll be fun. So it'll, we'll get those up as soon as possible. And you can watch any of this stuff on YouTube as well. Brilliant. All right, so that's the FCC thing. Um, and again, as I mentioned, it's not going to affect capital, which is part of the next thing I want to talk to you guys about. So when you negotiated your last contract, yep. You, you agreed to a scenario whereby FCAT would take over operation of Channel 15. Now, in a sense, we've already done that right. because we control your bulletin board. We, we update your bulletin board every week. Yep. And we obviously can override the channel here to go live. 
Beyond that, there's not a whole lot 15 can do mm -hmm. because of the SD hookup and because it's just so. Before I took this job, Doug Finn and then the, and the then head of engineering for Comcast gamed out a scenario whereby all the 15s in all the towns would come back through the Deerfield hub site. Yep. Okay. And since that idea was hatched, we've got a new server. And the server currently has channels. We, we program 12 and 23, which is in all four towns, and 15 in Deerfield. Yep. Out of the hub server in Deerfield. The idea we've been talking with Comcast about, and I stress the word talking because not a lot of action has occurred, is they want to use fiber to, re to reroute the 15s back to the, the hub yep. in Deerfield. And our Casta server, which is an HD server, right now I'm a, I can program all three of those channels and I can put Deerfield specific programs on Deerfield 15. The problem you have right now is this 15 beyond these meetings and the bulletin board doesn't do anything. What we want to do is be able to loop 15 through one of the channels on our server, which would allow me to go in and individually program Sunderland related programming all day long. I see. Rerun your select board meetings. Yes. Rerun your town meeting. Run Sunderland stories. Run the, the pieces on the, the park project. Run the Sunderland 300 stuff. Run regional programming that is of interest right. to people in Sunderland. The problem is to do that requires a certain capital outlay. What you have in front of you is a, an invoice that Waitley just received from Radiant Communications Corporation, which is a vendor through Comcast, to purchase what's called an HD-SD encoder. What this encoder does, essentially, is it takes the signal, shoots it back to the head end, shoots back an HD signal back into Deerfield through fiber that puts the channel 15 on the screen. So, so in other words, right now, your 15 doesn't do anything. If we do this with this encoder and purchase another channel from Comcast, or from Castus rather, your 15 will be able to be run through the main, the main uh, Castus hub mm -hmm. server, and I'll be able to go in there and put whatever you want, or whatever we want, on there. So you'll be able to, to program Sunderland programming on 15, which you can't do now. The problem with that is it's going to, there's going to be a, a capital outlay to do it. It's going to be the cost of this encoder plus the new channel for, for Castus for 15 would be $3,500 plus about $700 for installation fee by the company. So I don't know what your number is for capital right now, but I know you got 50 in the last contract. I think you got 11 last year. I don't know what was in there before. One of the things about this deal is I don't really have control over that money. Sure. If I want to buy something, I'm going to come to you guys and say, we got to buy this. You're, you're, are you looking for $3,500? What's that? Are you looking for $3,500? I'm saying As long you, as we could edit out, if I say something <laughs> stupid, we could edit it out. Well, unfortunately, Tom, we have it. gavel to gavel coverage. So if you say something stupid, it's on the record. Damn. We don't edit your meetings. <sighs> I, I'd love to. I know. I'd be able to institute a rim shot every once in a while to the, the sound. I'm just kidding. Um, that's funny. But I know. That'd be right. good, huh? Bing. I, I thought that's what she did back there. <laughs> she doesn't. She doesn't. Well, she chuckles back there a she, lot. Well, there's lots of... There's, she chuckles. Yeah, there's some funny moments here. I'm not I know. Be, one <laughs> of the more entertaining boards we cover. Um, so I'm, we're, I'm, still waiting for, we're still waiting for our, our, uh, our intro to be filmed also. <laughs> we're thinking of something like Beastie Boys, you know. No sleep until 116. Hood. No sleep until 116. Uh, I like yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, essentially... That's the first couple of numbers that I have for this process. Um, and like I said, I'm not gonna make any moves. I guess the question I wanna ask you is, do you want us to pursue this? Yes. Okay, you want us to pursue the... We want, we, we, we've, always, we, we've always been big supporters of, uh, in my opinion, we've always been... The, the greatest thing that public access TV does is it takes away it brings accountability to our government, in my in my opinion. So when Bruce Bennett says, "Well, you said," and I go, "Bruce, that's not what I said." They have a tape, and, and I, can, tape. I can go, I can go right to the tape, and 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 I can sit down. And Bruce has said, "I did not say that," and I think I I think it's coming very hand. It it I think it brings a an honesty. To, uh, I think be, because we, we unless unlike Congress. And state legislators, we don't meet in secret. Right. 
uh, we meet we meet out in public all the time and all our business gets done and we were just in a meeting sherry and i in deerfield and and i i let the and there was quite a few people there we were having trevor jonathan and i and the people there were have in the town of minnesota were having a very lively discussion and i stopped and i said look just so you know this is good this is healthy to have a conversation like this and and i i truly believe that so yeah so so having access to that to be able it's good stuff i mean we and should have the it. thing that makes this fcc thing so chilling is that kind of coverage that you talk about which i think is important as well it's one of the reasons why we spend so much time out at these meetings and people are like well, crap, God, it's so boring no it is it's 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 important that a record be kept yep of what's going on in these communities. So, you know, in 20 years or whenever, someone wants to go back and look at the discussion over the Riverside Park project. Perfect example. They can go back and, and learn everything they wanted to know that we recorded on our cameras. And the internet's in ink. It's going to be there forever. No matter what happens with us moving forward, those, those meetings will remain part of the public record on the web, on our YouTube page. My concern is if our knees get cut out from under us, in terms of funding, we're not going to be able to do the kind of things we do now. And I'm not just talking about the sports stuff for Frontier, which we love to do. There's a lot of stuff we do that is, I think people really like to watch. But it's the government stuff that I think is the crucial part. It's the cru it's, it's, it's the thing that, and you know, I, I hate to knock my brothers in the media and sisters, but there's not a lot of coverage of these towns right now. We're kind of the really? ball game right now. When when I started, we had we had Gazette, Recorder, every other week, Bill Sweet, yeah, from the Union, and and then whenever Montague didn't have a thing, you Massey from yep. was here, yeah. and 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 now I and see I never understood. I don't understand the newspapers today. If I want national news, I go to CNN or Fox or wherever, and I get national news. So I don't need to read national news in the Greenfield Recorder. Twelve hours after it's broken, mm -hmm. right? I, I would think that they, they would be they would be promoting the local and other good stuff that goes on in the communities, not just the, the murders and the, the whatever you would you or the accidents, but you promote you promote the good things that happen. And there's a lot of good stuff. There is, and, and that's one of the reasons why we, it's never been more important for us to be good at what we do. Absolutely, and I think Agreed. we're pretty good at it, actually. And we're, and we're working, we work at it very hard. These kids that work with me are, you know, some of them are just right out of high school, but they're serious about it. They're serious about it because they know we're serious about it. Right. Yeah. And, and we have some great people that I don't want to lose. And my biggest fear, not just of not being able to cover all the meetings, is not giving those kids a place to get professional experience. It's another part of it. You know, we, had, we just had a bunch of Frontier kids in here for the last week filming a movie. I don't have any idea what the movie is. I, all I saw was the pictures. I steered clear of it. It's some kind of lunatic film festival thing they're involved in. It's fantastic. Yeah. That's Kevin. Sure. Those kids wouldn't be able to do that anywhere else. Right. That's what we do. Yeah. And that's what we want to keep doing. So I just I send you, I give you this because to let you know that there's going to be some numbers coming your way, but I want to make sure that we want to do that we're we're going to pursue this track with Comcast, and and I can tell you that the technic they're in the weeds technically. We had four guys waiting trying to figure this thing out the other day, and none of them could figure it out. Huh. So it's not going to be anything. It's going to be immediate because they don't know how to do it. Yeah. And if they don't know how to do it. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm not exactly a technical whiz. I know what the big picture focus sure. is supposed to be, but how to get them my wires to work? The wrong dude. USBs, <laughs> you know, just just wands with carrier pigeons to Deerfield. Right. <laughs> Off they go. Don't, please don't give them any ideas. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that this guy from Comcast would do that if he could, right. just to get it off of his plate. <laughs> so. Anyway, that's that's where we are with that, and. Um, if I get any intel, Sherry, on an FCC decision, um, I'll send it to you as soon as I get it. I would, I would imagine there's going to be people in my industry spotting this at that meeting, and we'll sure. probably tweet out what happens, right away. and we'll go from there. But. So a couple of pieces of homework, Chris. We're going we're gonna to make sure to uh, share with you our quarterly revenues from mm -hmm. license fees. 
we'll give you a global update as far as capital dollars currently available and you owe us like a fixed price this is a swag from another another town you'll get us whatever the project yeah. is to do this you, right. what will happen is as long as you are okay with us mm -hmm. give me, i'll tell comcast yeah. to get the same invoice sent to us yep. for sundown that's fine yep and um yeah that's i just wanted to give you an idea of the number sure. you quoted and it's actually less than i thought it was going to be i had heard a ridiculous price of like seven thousand dollars sure so maybe they got a better deal. Yeah. <clears throat> Most of the infrastructure must be in there, but it's it's hardware and routing and exactly. whatever. Exactly. And, Makes and perfect sense. so I appreciate your support. Continue to be, yep. and, and uh, we'll keep plugging as long as we can. And don't mess up those Saturday night movies. No. <laughs> if anything, we're going to improve them. John's got an idea for a new intro that's even wackier than the old one. So it's, it's, it's we're going to we're updating all that stuff. It's such fun. Industry. It's just a lot of. Summertime's the time to sort of redo a lot of these old pieces of, yep. of media. So that's what we're doing right now. It's perfect. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris. Talk to you soon. All right. We got some minutes in front of us. Look at that. A replacement. Okay. Motion on July 15th. Uh, we have a motion that made for the minutes of July 15th. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Two to zero, please. Motion on July 22nd. And July 22nd, I'll second for discussion. July 22nd, we met on an off-scheduled week uh, in that the town was approached for a, a one-day filming permit. Uh, and because of timing, uh, the timetable, the production company wanted to uh, get its permit issued. It went through department heads, went through the insurance checks, uh, went through the permit fee application and people who were in and around town last Friday right. would have seen activity both at the elementary school and a car with a Russian arm on 47, it. a handful of drones, some blacked out Audis, the shutdown of Sunderland Bridge, all that stuff. And um, that's what that meeting was about. We did grant that permit. It was one day and it was uh, done. And I give them a fair amount of credit. And as Sherry had mentioned earlier tonight, uh, one of the contributions in kind uh, from the film company was a, a donation to be targeted toward uh, the Sunderland Elementary uh, playground reconstruction on the, on the preschool side. That was very generous. They didn't have to do that at all. They paid all their fees already, and they threw $5,000 in to help the playground. So, And it's nothing we actually asked for. Okay, good. Okay, that discussion aside, all those in favor of the minutes? Aye. Two to zero. Tommy, you want to weigh in also on the film permit side? Oh, it was, um, we, the movie was The Defense of Jacob or? Jacob. Defending Jacob, yeah. Defending, Defending Jacob. Jacob. It's gonna be on Apple. Um, actually, it's a very interesting book. Um, it, um, it, it's about a district attorney from Newton, Mass. That was uh, a, 14, a ten or fourteen-year-old uh, child was murdered, and five days into the investigation, it turns out that the district attorney's son was the uh, number one suspect. suspect. Yeah. So he recuses himself, and, and the story is about how he goes and defends or def tries to defend his son. So. It, it was a very interesting. Uh, it's a very interesting book. If you get the op opportunity, it's and it will. And Apple is going to be uh, doing. It was built by Paramount Pictures. Yep. Um, and Apple is putting together. They already have three years of shows that are already in the can, and they're supposed to be coming up next year. Yep. So you'll be able to get streaming service from Apple. And this one's a mini series. So and this is going to be one of them. It's a, I think he said six parts. Yeah, I think yes. Six parts. And it took place in, it's being filmed in 40 communities in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. including the Irving. Irving yep. was uh, along the Miller Falls, Falls River in Newton, um, Marshfield. Yeah. Marshfield as well. So there's 40 towns that they filmed in. It was an interesting piece that the director had, uh, producer had mentioned, producer had mentioned, in that all of the energy and effort to do this one day shoot in Sunderland, both the landscape and the quality of the uh, of the texture of the land was important. They were looking for that particular shoot, but for all the energy and effort, it might be about four seconds worth of video. <laughs> <laughs> but but <laughs> if you if you if you do watch the the show, right. the film. 
there's going to be a plane crash. Yeah, well, that's important. In a in a cornfield, corn right? And the I think J Lo is in, or, or Ca- Cameron Diaz or one of the stars of the movie. The thing changed, so they had to up the schedule of the plane crash yeah. into a cornfield. Mm-hmm. Most of us that have worked on a farm understand that corn is ready when it's ready, and that just because some producer in New York City or Hollywood says yeah. that we need to do the plane scene crash <laughs> today, field, right? and and the guy that's doing all the scouting and stuff like that tells us told us a story about how hard it is to find a cornfield that's basically right. with no corn's grown. It's crash worthy. <laughs> and he spent an exorbitant amount of time doing that, and. He said for all of that work, and he had to have permits from the FAA and whatever, paid a man, a farmer, exorbitant amount of money to, to grow corn in the ground before they would put corn in the ground. And then, then they found out that uh, it's probably be 10 seconds yeah. at the most. Seconds. It's so the plane crashes and they run into the woods. They're all, they're all done. About right. 10 seconds. Yeah. Anyways. So that occurred last last Friday, and that's what we met for last Monday was the issuance of the permit. There was no other action, no other action that the board took, and uh, that's what those minutes are all about. Roger. Okay, seven fifteen. We're going to have a uh, discussion about sewer extension. Rich, you want to come on up, and then we'll swing over to public uh, comment. Rich and Sherry and I met a week ago with developers from Sugarbush Meadow. And they have asked for uh, the town's sentiment about tying the Sugarbush Meadow project into our wastewater treatment system. Uh, Rich and I had spoken a month ago, month and a half ago ish about well, what could that even look like? What routes would there be? Is it force? Is it gravity? Uh, in the meeting with the developer, again, this is only an uh, preliminary uh, discussion there's no decisions being made the question is do you want to run 8300 feet or 9000 feet of forest main what does it mean for land crossings road crossings lift stations does the capacity of the plant have does a global plant have capacity does any lift stations on the way need upgrading etc 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 and uh, I was uh, charged with meeting with the group, and uh, Rich and I are here tonight to kind of go over the 101 of what that discussion was. The question is, how do you get from way over on Plum Tree to somewhere near the sewage treatment plant? And how do you make it beneficial to the town? So there was discussion about availability for people to tie in if it was uh, if it was something that the town pursued uh, what kinds of crossings would be imported what kinds of whether utilities would be impacted if you were going to start running around six inch sewer lines or eight inch sewer lines and I see in their schematic design they had two lift stations they had lift put inside there they went gravity to a lift gravity to a lift and then that's, that's the second profile yeah second profile right so Anyway, that was they, they captured the conversation correctly. I mean, they're 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 eager. They're also realistic with with respect to time. There's no way something like this is going to get built before that project is complete. I just personally don't see that. Um, but that's who knows. Who knows? Sherry, we left with homework about rights of ways and crossings, and that's something we're still waiting for some um, guidance with uh, town council. Uh, but Rich, um, outside of my characterization, anything jump out? We had lift station homework. Do we have capacity globally? And I think the answer is probably okay. Yep. It's an amazing amount of waste that comes out of 150 units by nameplate. But um, the plant has capacity, as, yep. as you suspect. Yep. Um, and I suspect the line on profile B would have capacity also. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that self, self silver okay. um, line. Um, I would I would expect it to have capacity. I don't know for sure. Right. right. Um, and um, profile B would probably benefit the most users because it's gravity to lift station, like you spoke. Yep. Um, doesn't require any special connection. It would just be a typical gravity connection. Yep. Um, 
they stated they they felt it would be three lift stations and maybe that's true I don't know um, the last bit would have to be a force main because on South Silver you come upgrade by the um, by the kitchen garden and that's where the last last manhole is on South Silver um, and that would definitely be a force main for sure um, other things for the town to consider um, maintenance costs of these lift stations maintenance costs of the extra infrastructure um, utility costs obviously electricity costs backup generators for any of the any of the lift stations yep. any of the pump stations require those um, you know the town would obviously require them but DEP also requires them um, that actually makes sense. Yep. to stay within the right-of-way I mean I think that's possible um, whether they stay in the roadway or on the edge of the roadway, they're still going to disturb the roadway. There's still going to be a lot of a lot of things to consider on the town's end about accessing this from that. Um, and there's a stream crossing too. I don't know exactly where that is on Profile B, yeah. um, but I do know where the uh, crossing is on Profile A, the 116 crossing. That's that bridge down. Mm -hmm. Just by the, the by the water trout station yeah, by, the, yeah. by the wire by the by the um, the well for the water system by Hubbard's yeah Hubbard well but I mean at, you know like I said capacity wise I mean, so capacity wise for the hundred and fifty units or capacity wise for all for everybody that's a different story <laughs> well that's the point in in yeah. in, in, my, in in again for me. Why? Why would we? Why would we even look at that if it's not beneficial to everybody? I mean, we very seldom do we do one for one yep. person. We're a community, mm -hmm. so yeah. why? So why would we even start to look at putting in us to use our and not everybody along the way? Now, if you're going to design it from a design perspective, Tom, your, your position is, is spot on. It shouldn't be for the 150 units that are going to be delivering X. It should be for every potential house that go, it, that line goes by and make it a legit sewer extension. Why, why else would we consider it? It's the reason we had the first discussion. I know. Yeah. I, and, and so. And I was pleasantly surprised if I could just inject that they yeah. came back with a pair of gravity and lift stations as opposed to a force main. Originally, it was like force main the whole way. And if you wanted to tie into that, you know, at your own peril. Okay. And and oh, so so you put in. So who's my my thing is who who's paying for the maintenance of? You got 150 units. Sure. So 150 times 300 dollars. Sure. Okay. Yeah, does he, so who, that that wouldn't that wouldn't cover the cost of that maintenance of that of that system, yeah. right? I mean, because each, each of the lift stations would have to have an emergency generator. Each of the so that's you know so so you have to maintain that. You have to maintain the switch gear. You have to maintain who who I'm right, who's going to jet rod the system. Who's who's going to when the pumps? You have to have two pumps and every you have to have redundant redundancy. So you're going to have to have how many how many train electrical services are you going to have to entail yep. so why would we do it <laughs> and, and again if it's benefiting the town if it's benefiting the people along plum tree and south silver and um north plain road eh, that's a that's a different that's so a that's a huge conversation makes it a discussion point as yeah, absolutely to, right, right but so sorry bruce I think what you ought to look at too is what the future development would be sure. out in that area yep. and people hitching up. Yep. Because that's an added burden of cost on the town. Right. You know, we've been trying to save farmland and everything, mm -hmm. and I think I kind of agree with Tom where this discussion should stop now. They got that permit and they got that building through, they knew what the situation was and let them live by it. Sure. To Bruce's point, if I could. Uh, Bruce, one of the areas of impact is someone who uh, worked diligently uh, and closely with that project was, does it constitute a substantial change? Now that you have, a substantial change. Sure it is. Now that, yeah. you have, now that you have your permit, you want to yeah. make, you want to just like 
you know, I don't use the term bait and switch lightly, but you know, bait and switch, like yeah, really, come on. Into, <laughs> right. And, and again, if in my in my opinion, I, I if it's beneficial for the people that that live in the area, absolutely, we should get we should we should look at it, absolutely. So if they want to come forward with a plan that's beneficial for for, mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we are. We're a community. That that's what we do. We, I mean, you can't, sh you know, and in and in like when the, the the country garden when they when they put in their force main or Thomas's, they're they're that's business coming into right. that community, right. and we and we sign an agreement with them also that they're going to maintain it. Are, are, are do you, I don't think they're going they're going to want to come forward with any type of agreement that they're going to pay for the maintenance of their seven thousand sure. feet of system. I don't think so. And and I. I don't know. I it, you know. Well, that's that's, that's my opinion. Yeah, it's considered an update. And I think Rich, Rich has, we collectively have some homework. We left that meeting, recognized that it would only make sense if the ability for anybody whose property that line goes by has has the ability to tie in. It's the only way it would even become a discussion point. So that sizing, that initial engineering is very, very important. Again, as I said at the beginning, I was pleasantly surprised with B showing that they had gravity lift, gravity lift. I was like, oh, so they, they you know, they, that was not plan A by any stretch of the imagination. And I was pleasantly surprised to see that. That said, those design considerations are radically different than what's currently being proposed. Oh, or, all right, Scott, where do you put lift stations and maintain in, inside the work? Inside the road layout, it, yeah, it would depend on the size of the right of way, and yeah. especially on uh, on North Plain. I don't know. Right. I don't think the town's right of way is much okay. larger than the road. Right. And, and and now now you're now you're now you're now you're putting lift stations in through a community that you're not going to allow access to, and then disruption of, of you're going to you're going to pl plant a a, a a pumping station in in front of Mr. Schleppi's house if he was down the down in the southern portion of town. I don't think Mr. Schleppi would like to see a pumping station out there that he can't use. Permitting was use I know you would. <laughs> well, so I, I don't, so, so that, that, that doesn't make, I don't, I don't, I guess I just missed something, Rich. But I'm not a businessman, so. <laughs> but I, I agree, with, I, 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 I mean, yeah, you wanna go 7,000 or 8,000 feet and make it so that uh, the, the residents in that community can take advantage of it. Sure, let's talk about it. But just to put, you know, you're going to go get 8,000 with three lift stations, and and you're going to going to have 150 units tie into it, and you're going to be paying the same amount of that everybody else is paying. And we're going to have, and right now we'll be, in town we have two lift stations, two, two, right. that service the entire sewer system. Now we're going to put three pump stations in for 150 users. Doesn't make sense to me. Gravity. It's gravity, baby, Tom. It's the. It's not a rule. It's a law. You know, back in <laughs> Galileo was a very intelligent man, and he figured out that apple. He fell down. He he fig And you know what? Gravity's consistent. Yes, it is. At least on Mother Earth. Yes, it is. But, Which but it works. But but if you you get down to what 12, 14 feet, and then you ain't going to go any deeper. Mm -hmm. So then the water is going to come back up. It does. That's what those stations are for. So again, preliminary design. I wanted to apprise the board of what we're what we're being asked to consider, and uh, we have homework ourselves to do. And again, this will come this will uh, come forward when David's here for you know go no go decision to Bruce's uh, I point. Would, I would like to add, Mr. Chair, that I don't want to expend any town funds. Sure. On, I, so I don't want to be talking to legal or anybody mm -hmm. else mm -hmm. on a, on a hypothetical for something that that's not going to be servicing our community as a whole. Fair point. Fair point. In my opinion. Richmond, anything else? Um, well, actually, probably one other thing. Um, How's your I and I going? We'll find the results out when it's complete. Yeah, boy. <laughs> Good um, answer. But. Um, Lift stations in general, um, those are going to be located in residential neighborhoods. Um, there are oil concerns, things like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, generally, don't get any order concerns out of the pump stations. Um, 
but there have been notes of odor concerns in the past. Mm -hmm. um, there's only two, like you stated. Yep. So now you're gonna put three in a residential neighborhood. Uh, I, a big concern of mine. Yep. With with flashing lights and and sure. maintenance going in there at seven o'clock when you you send your guys on Sunday morning to go out and do their inspections and they open up the doors and everything's running and yep. absolutely and and you have to do that. Yep. Correct. You're taking samples, whatever you're doing. So to be devil's advocate, why wouldn't it be a private lift and not not part of anything of our infrastructure except for the one place it ties in? Right? From a design perspective, say, listen, you guys and gals, you own everything from address X to import Y and it includes all of the maintenance. I can think of a big reason why they'd want us to include us. How how is a private how's a private entity entity going to go to to Mr. Schleppi's house and and put up a uh, a pumping station if you, the town can do it by eminent domain if it has to? How how how's a sure. private entity going to do it? I meant maintenance. Some. I'm just talking about building it, Scott. Never mind. Never get to maintenance. Well, I, and you're going to put a driveway in some. In some, you're going to put a dry. You're going to put a driveway in someone's uh, front yard so, to maintain. It's important to characterize the discussion from the meeting. There was no way this was a municipal project. Really? That was that was a that was a, a hard boundary. It was not going to be a municipal job. They were going to turnkey that. Hmm. Okay. And again, for 150. 150 people, you're going to allow, allow them to come down the side of the road and not not disturb what the existing utilities and not, people's lawns. Sure. And I'm neither advocating and nor shoulder. devil's advocating well, for it. I'm just saying what was presented. And if you're benefiting everyone, I, I if, mm -hmm. in my opinion, if you're benefiting everyone, sure. let's talk about it. If you're, in bit, you're, you're, you're benefiting some a small group of people at the benefit of a lot of people, mm -hmm. That's not how. That's not how we work. And those were the parameters the discussion was left at. Good. Pretty straightforward. I mean, I'd well, like to see their next proposal then. There you go. Well, there's not really a proposal right now at all. It's a concept. It's concept. Like more concept than reality. Okay. All right. Thanks, Rich. I appreciate it. Okay. Let's talk speeding. Hey, public Thanks, comment. Rich. Look, Breer, Breerville. Breerville is in the house. Uprising. Right. <laughs> Um, good evening, you guys. Thanks so much for giving us some uh, some time to come in. Um, we've uh, we've got a good chunk of the neighborhood on uh, uh, North Sunderland here, yeah. um, and I'm not sure whether it's because we're going across the street more often, or whether there's been a change in uh, you're just home more <laughs> habits. But we're just seeing and people fly down Falls Road. Um, and it seems the vast majority of them are, are then turning up Old Sunderland and heading into Montague, Montague. as opposed to heading down Meadow Road huh. and going somewhere there. Um, so it seems the pattern is folks looking for a shortcut, which I'm not sure it's a shortcut, but a, a more scenic route that they mm. can speed through as they um, um, head through our neighborhood. Interesting. And as, as you all know, um, our neighborhood uh, at Falls Road at that point is probably one of the narrowest roads um, mm -hmm. in Sunderland. I think there's about a nine foot travel lane mm -hmm. um, uh, between the stone wall on one side and uh, uh, you know the, the mailbox on the other. Um, we've got tons of pedestrians and bicycles mm -hmm. um, going that, down that road. So unlike many other streets in town, we've got a lot of non-vehicular traffic um, right. there, um, and, it's, and it's remarkably narrow, um, um, and amazingly scenic. It really is a, um, um, a jewel. We, we all love to live there, and obviously there's a lot, lots of people who love to come visit there because of bird watching and bicycling and walking and, and a variety of other things. Um, so we, um, we wanted to come together, begin a conversation with you guys as to um, what might be done. We've, we've had good um, conversations with the chief. Um, he's sent um, uh, officers up there on a number of occasions. Um, Molly was home a couple of weeks ago to watch, uh, I think, four or five um, uh, people stopped. 
and um, uh, the officer said it's like shooting fish in a barrel. Everybody who drives down that road is driving 45 and 50 miles Not me. Yeah, not, you. not me. Not you and not me, but um, not it is me. amazing how many folks are flying down that road. Um, you know, when they go 35, it seems like a breath of fresh air mm -hmm. compared to the 25 mile an hour speed limit. But they're not going 35. Um, they're moving right along. Um, Reen and I were out working in the uh, the front yard the other day, and somebody just about came off the street, not paying any attention, going too fast, and, and um, you know I nearly had to jump out of the way. And, and mm. uh, um, so it, it it is a dangerous situation between the uh, the mixed uses there, pedestrians and bicycles and and vehicles traveling too fast, mm -hmm. um, and a very narrow roadway as you're going from um, the Montague line, um, you know, to, uh, to Chart Pond. So um, looking to begin a dialogue, begin a conversation about, you know, what, what can be done there through, you know, whether it's enforcement tools, whether it's physical infrastructure, um, whether it's blowing up the road at the Montague line and just having <laughs> it... Uh, <laughs> Let it fill up with cars. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, uh, we, we've got a dangerous situation there that, um, uh, that I think needs to be addressed more aggressively uh, than it's been. And I'll, I'll invite my, uh, my neighbors to, uh, to jump in um, here as well. Yeah, and in addition to what Gary has said, people also slow down and park to look at the falls of the river. Mm -hmm. Bicycles do the same thing, and they begin to ease out into the road, which narrows it even further, which really creates a hazard. And it's just an accident waiting to happen, in my view. Bruce, are we in? Now, I would suggest that you make it a private road, put a fence at the <laughs> Falls Road end of the northern line and down by Chard Pond and have a little key that lets everybody through. Of the century. Nice, nice. Please. Can I just say that I park, park with them. Yeah. I've lived there since I was 12 years old, but I'm certainly there, so yeah. it's been a while. And I have to say that this is a problem that has existed for a long time. Mm -hmm. Because um, when my parents first bought their house here, um, we were just kids. And they were so concerned at that time with much fewer cars. That we were never meant to ride bicycles. Sure. We never had bicycles. And the problem now is much worse than it was then. But my mother, when she lived at Penn House, often used to say that she was more, she was sh almost sure that she would die from getting hit by a car or a bicycle mm. than from natural causes. Fortunately, she did. But three of those houses were there, including mom. And my parents used to live in the house or something. Mm -hmm. And the apartments are right on the road. Right, right so on the road. So when you step off the step to go to your car, mm -hmm. you're in the road. And it, it isn't, and plus the fact that it's near, there's a lot of blind spots there too. Good point. So it's a very dangerous situation, which is long overdue for being addressed. Okay. So we've talked to the chief about enforcement pieces, right? And then there's the question about uh, deterrence pieces, whether they are interactive signage or whether they're seasonal speed bumps, something that kind of says, hey, wait a minute, something's going to happen up here. Slow down. Uh, density, the, 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 density is, the density is important, but it's also narrow by definition. So if you don't, you don't get to the full length, then we have, there's a challenge, according to the chief, with the density. There's density for a very narrow period, and that space, that makes perfect, yeah. sen perfect sense. But you also have to compound that with a very narrow right-of-way. So it's, it's, a, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting challenge in front of us. Uh, with respect to seasonal pieces, I guess the, the question would be about something that's pulled out Thinking about rubber mounts, something that you know you warn the you warn the motorist. Hey, there's a, a large hump in coming your way, but 
or do you put up interactive signs or do you simply ticket the hell out of everybody and then figure it out? You know, conditioning people takes the longest, usually about three generations, and we still manage to screw that up, right? Mr. Mr. Chair, the only, the only the disheartening is that the people that are, that are traveling at high rates of speed on Falls Road mm -hmm. probably live within a mile yep. of Falls Road, two miles. They don't live, I mean, and and so they're they're part of the they're part of the landscape, mm -hmm. and I could say that if you go through the Montague Center, they are very people that live in that area are are acutely aware of the speed limits going through there because they have people walking and everything else like that. Mm -hmm. But if you there's people that live in Montague Center that are going on Falls Road at a high rate of speed. Sure. I'm not singling anybody out. I'm just I just yeah. know that yeah. the the numbers tell us that they have to right. live not too far from Falls right. Road. Right. Yeah. When we have when and it goes back to when Evan was chief and when Jeff was chief and and now with Eric, they'll tell you when they do and and when we actually did interviews of chief of police candidates mm -hmm. and we talk about speeding and they typically will say when in Sunderland if you do a an enforcement if you're along Plumtree Road and do enforcement of a speed on Plumtree Road typically the people that are speeding on Plumtree Road live in the town of Sunderland mm -hmm. and typically live within a mile or two of the location that they're stopped. I, I know on, what's the road that goes between Bure Crossroad? There's a person that goes on Bure Crossroad that this person complains to me all the time about going on Bure Crossroad 45, 50 miles an hour. Bure Crossroad from, from Town Hall to North Main Street. Right. I don't know how you can go that fast, but he showed, and the person's going that fast. And I and 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 he's actually spoke to the person. He says, you know that hey, I got kids here. The person just doesn't slow down. And so I I I know because sometimes I've been passed on Falls River. I've been mm -hmm. passed on Fall. It's not enough for two cars to get by on Falls Road, and I've been passed right by Chard Pond. Yeah. So I have no idea who would do that. I, I know what you're saying, and I live on 47 North. And if you talk to the highway superintendents, and and I know Bruce knows this from a personal thing, on 47 North, the how I, I if ever I see uh, somebody working in a, a uh, uh, working on trees or the telephone or our highway department, right. I pray for them that they don't get run over because the cars. And, and again, Gary's right when I. Speed them there by my house is 40 miles an hour. If somebody goes by 40 miles an hour, I don't hear them. Sure. They'll go by 60. And, and, and we, we actually see the data that comes back to us. And we see people in fault that go on, 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 on 47 North that are in excess of 65 miles an hour. Hmm. I, I, don't, I don't know how to stop them. I, I know. I, 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 I know typically when, when they talk about speed enforcement, if you try to put bumps or something in the road, a lot of professionals frown on that because of the accidents that you could cause sure. and some, you can cause more accidents than the speeding. So I don't, I don't know what the answer is. When you talked, someone mentioned before, I think it was you, uh, temporary, I mean, that's not the word you used, speed bumps. Temporary. Seasonal. 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 So are those those like heavy rubber things that are put on the road? Mm -hmm. And yes. you're saying that that would be would that be a solution in which it was? I I I I would I would I would we would we would need to talk to some civil engineers and and they would know better than I I just know from discussions I have had because we've we have looked at and, and there's a lot of things there's there's things they call tables. Um, where, t where you come up and you're and then and you go back down. They have tables and they got um, traffic calming devices. Is I think is, a, but you would have to. But on a road like, 
and, and you put it in, in, and people would start going around the traffic. You know, they would no, they I would start going out into the dirt. I, I mean, so yeah, we'd have to talk to some professionals to see what they can do. Well, I'm, I don't even know whether that would be the answer because the people that speed are do that all year. But what Absolutely. we're saying, it's worse in the summer because of the people on bikes and walking. So it's more dangerous. But the speed, I, 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 I'm thinking that they, you know, we we we're we're seeing we're seeing we're seeing not we're we're seeing this issue not only just on Falls Road, not okay. in North Main, but it's all over town. We we, mm -hmm. we got a, uh, concerns from some residents on on North Plain Road also. I I don't know how I mean it's a 25 mile an hour speed limit on North Plain Road, and they, and and they're saying they got 30 if they go 35 like you're saying if if they go by a 35 they're lucky. I just don't see how anybody can travel that fast on that road. Mm -hmm. and, and our hope, I, I don't think that a perfect solution exists. Mm -hmm. um, I've done my internet searches for whatever that's worth, just studying different solutions. I, I think that um, an imperfect solution is the best, the, the best that we could hope for, um, as long as, you know, if we were to agree that action is worthwhile taking with the understanding that this is a more widespread issue. Um, personally, I don't feel safe um, in my yard. Um, I, I think maybe you could say the same. Um, I, I think the best we could hope for is an imperfect solution that might limit uh, a portion of the speeding. Um, but I, I agree, I, I've noticed speeding elsewhere. I believe it is a more widespread issue. Um, hopefully for the reasons that Gary had laid out, it's a little bit of a unique problem with the volume of, of bikers that we have um, and pedestrians that we have. Um, I agree. I, I told I told the highway superintendent not to pave north when they paved uh, 47 north. I told him don't pave it. I love potholes. I'm on thinking 47. that we should let our road go to pot, so to speak. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> that people have to slow down. Do remember I, years ago? We we've had people come to petition us to get their 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 roads paved, and I go, what's I said, what's wrong with a nice dirt? I said, what's wrong with a nice dirt road? And they go, oh no, we want to pave, blah blah. And I said, well, just to let you know, you're probably going to be talking to us about three, four months later about how you'd rather to go back to the dirt road once it's paid because people go fast. I, and, and I'm serious when I tell people, I said, I, I love potholes. I said, I know what the potholes are and I'm coming home. I don't care. I go 40 miles an hour, 35 miles an hour. It doesn't bother me. But I... I, sometimes I wonder, and then, then we got you know people that ride bikes that say, well, you, the the road you, you put chip seal down and it's tougher on the bikes. It's like, yeah, but maybe it's try to people go a little slower because they don't want to hear the noise. You know, I, I don't know. It, it's it's tough. I, I I I think that we can ask we can ask the Sherry. To, I mean, we can talk to maybe C H C H A. He'll Harvard. be here. Um... John's Six coming, right? Weeks. For a couple of weeks. <laughs> yep. And we can ask him as a side what 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 can do, you know. Yeah. I'll be going to district two in a week or so too, so I can maybe yeah. run. Well, I agree with you guys. Bruce. They've been speeding there forever. Mm -hmm. And they speed on Route 47, that we live down North uh, South Plain Road, they speed there, they speed on Plum Tree. You get out there, you write tickets, you do whatever you want. What happens with the police is you go out there and write a ticket, it's two hundred dollar ticket. And then it goes against your insurance, and the next thing they're going to be here is coming to you guys saying, hey, this is too harsh to report them. You know? But I, I drove up and down it a couple times today just to look at it. And there's a speed limit sign right before you get to Chired Pond that says 25 miles an hour. Now, when I grew up, there, that, that thickly settled sign was about halfway between the cove and, and uh, 296 Falls Road, and it had a thickly settled sign, and I, I believe the sign was 25 miles an hour back then. This is going back mm -hmm. 60s, 70s. And I think if they put a bigger sign up there, you know, it'll slow people down more there than it, you know, when you get to Chired Pond, if you're going 35 or 40, you know, you slow down to 25 there and, you know, get people going to work and, you know, Part of the problem too is people think speed is no big deal and they do what they want to do anyways, you know. But the, the other issue there is you got a dangerous situation up near uh, the town line where the road's starting to wash out. Mm -hmm. And they just keep dumping stuff in there. Well my suggestion is is you close the road for safety reasons, 
until you do an engineering study and get the road fixed there. And that could take five, six, seven years. <laughs> no, that's the answer. You, you I'll, know, I'll, I mean, I'll sign up for that. I, I mean, that's a realistic yeah. thing, because yes. someday that road's going to go right into the river there. Well, there's another component here, and that's farm machinery and yeah. mm -hmm. workers at the Red Fire Farm. Mm -hmm. And there's awful, that yeah. traffic has increased dramatically. Yeah. And it seems to me that I see in the Amish country they have signed speed limits because of wagons. And I don't see why we couldn't enforce even a slower speed limit on that road because of the heavy farm industry usage. Fair. I don't think we get much lower than 25. It takes, it takes the entire width of the road and they come up and down. That's true. Uh, interesting. I've taken notes on all this. You know, it, it's truly amazing no one has got hurt on that road. Yeah. That oh, mean, but, that but that's not true. People oh, have gotten hurt on that road. Yeah, I know, but I mean, numbers wise, I mean, you know, Virginia's rolled up and down that road on a bicycle for years. Yeah. How many? How many? Yeah, it's amazing. She never got bit. I mean, that's at night time too. I know. And that's, 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 you know, that twenty-five mile per hour sign before it jumped from. I think people do slow down there because it's so crowded, mm -hmm. especially if there's a car coming up this direction. But they seem to think that the twenty-five mile per hour is only till you get past you. That's fair. And it'd be nice if there was a good size sign. Between, like around where the cold is, for example, because there's no sun at any miles per hour. Mm, interesting. Or a giant pump until after Monica. Great point. Well, the history of that road, I'm, I'm sorry, you finished? Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember the Samoskis when they were still growing uh, cucumbers. Uh, they wanted to widen that road that cut the trees out on both sides of Montague when they redid that portion of the road called Meadow Road that was several years ago. And a long time ago. And since then, the road has been, I'm going to say, improved, but hazardously so. Well, it's wider. And that was because of the milk trucks. That was the reason why they did that. I yeah, I was stopped by a Stady on the road in my Land Rover years ago, and I was driving down the center of the road. He said, why are you driving down the center of the road? Because all the side road was all broken up. I said, well, there's no road on the side. That's what we have to do. So break up the road. Break up the road. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if from, from everything I know, for what it's worth, like it, whatever. Uh, there's background to this, but people just go faster if the road is straight, if it is wide, and it is smooth. Sure. Um, and so, uh, and if there's any impediment on the road whatsoever, then people tend to slow down. So like. You know, I don't, I don't know if the time is right now for different solutions. Um, I've definitely thought of some, um, but you know, without, um, without knowing ex exactly if there would be action, when there'd be action, what the budget would look like, I think there, there are many different things we could do. I'm like ha happy to participate in the conversation. I don't think that um, any of us are looking to have any high budget um, fix. Uh, it might require a series of smaller solutions with everything from like optical illusions mm -hmm. to inserting a small kink in the road. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of different things that we could do, but I would um, I would definitely like to, to see how I could participate in being proactive about it prior to something bad happening. Did you say a tank or a kink? A tank would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly persuasive, uh, but a kink, yeah. I also noticed that Montague is a street there. has eliminated all of their dirt roads north of us. Mm -hmm. And they're all paved now, That's which right. means more traffic. more traffic. Right. And then they come off the hill. Right. Down. And then, oh, people don't stop at the bottom of the hill either. I mean, Foster's Road is a good example. Well, you live rather than that. Yep. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, the people come. Are there enforcement solutions, technology that, that uh, could be applied there, but but maybe can be applied at other places in town as well. Um, um, in talking to the chief, he was talking about a seventeen thousand dollar piece of equipment that allows you to monitor speeds even when there's not an officer standing right there. But it it certainly sounds like we've got issues on on uh, North Plain, we've got issues on Falls Road, mm -hmm. we've got issues in a variety of places, and. Um, you 
you know, I wonder if there are some <coughs> solutions that might be a benefit in a variety of different uh, places in town. Well, it's interesting. Um, in, when Chris Collins was here a short time ago about, um, my daughter says to me, Jesse, the smart one, <laughs> and, and she said, do you know that you can't take a right turn at the intersection anymore? And I go, yes, I do. And she says, well, what did they do that for? I said, well, because we have, there, there's a huge number of, of people, pedestrians and bicycles, that's been hit from the people that don't stop at that intersection. And, and, right. and so we had a con we, we're, and we, we get the emails and the letters, and, and we asked the state to take a look at that. And the, and the state, I, I mean, I've never seen the state do something as quick as they did. And I, so they must have not, so they must have not been watching that as carefully as they did. But they had those signs up in what, a week? Mm -hmm. Less than a week. They had signs up about no turn on red. And, and, unless, and unless you were in the board of selectmen's office or talk to the chief of police, you would never know about all the pedestrians that had gotten hit, some seriously, some not, all the bicyclists that had been hit, some serious, some not, and all the fender benders that, that in, in that intersection is considered one of the most hazardous in Franklin County. Um, but, and, and, but it took them you know, to talk about things to do, but that seemed like it, that seemed like a, a no-brainer. It's like because every one of us that have been ever been at the corner store or at the, at the congregational church or whatever, you, or walking across the street, yep. if you walk across the street, you're taking your life in your own hands because you never you you and Jesse said, well, you push the button. I said, yeah, but you push the button and lights turned red. But people are so they're used to just coming to that intersection. There's a right turn on red. And they just they look to their left, mm -hmm. and the person's crossing to the right, and you never see them. Yeah. Uh, getting back to Gary's point about high tech surveillance, I would urge caution in that oh. area. Uh, I suppose at the root of this is education. That's a good word, uh, but high tech surveillance, yeah. I, I think, would be not the way to go. Uh, we're surveilled enough with our little pocket monster devices that we all carry with us. And, you know, it's, there has to be some other kind of solution. I agree. How, how would that, if, if, we, if we were to all agree that something should be done, how does that decision process work? Um, we need more stake, more stake, there's more stakeholders involved than they're in this room right now. We'd bring those stakeholders together and have a broader discussion. Bruce? Just as, as Gary said, there is a technology, and I know my daughter got a ticket. She was in Washington, D.C., and she wasn't going like 50 miles an hour and mm -hmm. 25 miles an hour zone with no traffic. Took a picture of her car with a speed and everything. She got $200 ticket. Mm -hmm. So that technology is there. Oh, yeah. But uh, I mean, I, I have to, you know, what's that? That's a, that's a revenue enhancer. That's what that is. Sure. You sure. Know? But I mean, like I said, let the road wash out there. You know what I mean? That's, that's, that's a simple thing. Love cost. You know, in Singapore, they do it very easily. They don't have they don't have police officers sit out with 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 radar guns. They just they every car has a set speed that it's allowed to go to. They have a little they they have a little yellow light. I'm serious. They have a little uh, yellow light on top of the car, and when when they exceed that speed, the little light comes on, and the police officer just goes, and they give them a ticket. It's, it's very We're simple. I'm not recommending that plan. Uh, <laughs> no, and we can't, we can't cane anybody either? No, no, no. <laughs> Along the same lines, uh, we were in Italy one year, and uh, six months later, I get a citation from an Italian municipality via Scoff Law U. And that ticket was expensive. There were two tickets. And it was automatic uh, speed trap. And it went right to the municipal government, and they got, they took a picture of your car and your license, they just mailed you the citation, that was it. Mayor, and that's they, a kind of active. The industry is so far behind, they never catch up with you, so. <laughs> They're too busy chasing their pensions. Get your attention. All right. Okay. So, so 
So basically, I think we'll we'll talk to we'll talk to John in a couple weeks, and we'll ask him what calming devices that he can recommend, and maybe there's something that we can do in that respect. Because I, I think there's more than just one place we could put it into effect. That's very euphemistic, saying a calming device. <laughs> I, I, I've sat enough. I've sat in enough meetings. That I learned. I learned certain terminologies, and <laughs> and we and they call it calming devices. And I, I learned about the width of lines and. And will he go out to Falls Road, Tom? What's that? Will he go out to Falls Road and look at the unique situation? There? That's what we're going to ask him to do. Yeah, we're going to ask him that. We'll ask him that. Could we have other? We have we have issues. Other words also. I I, I don't. I. I mean, we are. This is it's, it's it is frustrating because. Like I said, most of the people that are speeding live within a couple miles of that location, and they wouldn't want you know they wouldn't want you going by their homes at 50, 60 miles an hour either. But I, ca I come out of my driveway, I come out of my driveway some, and and I'm a, I come out of my driveway, and then I'm amazed at how fast there's someone because I can see quite a ways up the road, and I'm amazed at how quick people. Get, I go, where the heck did that car come from? I, I have no idea, and I, I know that's what you guys do also. We, we all, it, it's, it's, you know, we're all in a rush to go someplace. And, and, and in <laughs> fact, we could make the entire town a 25 mile an hour speed zone, and you know how much time would add on to people's commute right now? I mean, it's simple math. Speaking of that, like up by your house, there's a sign that says 25 miles an hour. Yes. What, what, what's... A little bit of history on that, Tom. The 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 state legislators not too long ago they 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 they're trying to make things easier for communities. So before for us to try to lower a speed limit, mm -hmm. it, it was an amazing. Yeah, you do it oh, it's a it's a yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what they did they said is that a, a community can adopt a by uh, a, a provision that says that the speed limit in town is 25 miles an hour unless it's posted otherwise. So that's what we've done. And, and, and that was really started because of some of the concerns that we heard along uh, North mm -hmm. Plain Road. We adopted at that was adopted at a town meeting. Right. Yeah. That was a, that was adopted at a town meeting two and town meetings ago. Yeah. Is is what, the, does the fine in relationship to what the, the other fines are when it's a state highway or a state numbered highway? You know, so many, so many dollars for so many miles an hour over the speed limit. Or is it specified in the town bylaw with the fines? I, um, there was no not in the bylaw. Not in the bylaw. It's not the bylaw. But but, but it's, a, it's a legal speed limit, so it would follow follow the rules of the Commonwealth in that respect. And and we thought it was a good, we thought it was a good, and, and it, we we had to bring it for acceptance at town <coughs> meeting, so we accepted it at town meeting. But it, it made sense, you know, no, unless was, yeah. unless. It's confusing. It is because I, I know the first time I looked at it, I said, "Whoa, this is 40 mile an hour here." And it says, "And there's a 25." But if you go, if you're going slow enough to read the sign, the sign says, Tell "I know." I, I tr trust me, I did it a couple times. Mm -hmm. But it says, um, "On uh, town of Sunderland, 25 miles unless mm -hmm. posted otherwise." And we have there's another sign next right there that says 40 miles an hour. So. Um, related topic, uh, a couple weeks ago there was a survey team from GZA um, doing a, uh, some engineering research at um, Chard Pond relative to the dam mm -hmm. right there. Um, has the town received any report on that? Okay, not at this point. Um, apparently they were doing that dam survey mm -hmm. for DCR and going to be reporting back to them on the condition of, of that dam and um, um, what what improvements uh, might be required, which would certainly have an impact on, sure. on the road as well. Bruce? Cool. Like maybe a long-term impact. Right. Uh, we I, might have to come in from Whitmore Crossroad. <laughs> to, uh, we almost closed that road. We came really close. Bruce? I know... Um, the landowner several years, maybe going back four or five years ago, received mm -hmm. a notice mm -hmm. about that dam is one of the ones that, uh, you know, it's in a certain category. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't know whether they've updated or stuff, but I think that report goes right to the landowner. Because that's it a private owned dam. Correct. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that yeah. pond's just about filled up with 
I mean, they're going to be a bond in another couple of years. Right. Right. I mean, it's just going to be a credit going through. You're, yeah, right, you're right. You're right about the, the dam because the town, the tone, the town is notified right. for informational purposes. I think, yeah. And it, it's probably our, our last notification. It probably predates when Sherry was here. Right. Yeah. It's gonna be like anything. four or five years ago. It's right. it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. My understanding yeah. was that the um, dam owner was unresponsive Correct. to DCR, and so DCR was taking the initiative. Um, and uh, the engineers indicated that they would probably provide informational report to mm -hmm. you guys. As yeah, well. so. that's correct. Yeah, initially, the town was approached, and we reminded the agency that was concerned about the safety of the dam that it was not a town property. And then it went yeah. absent or AWOL, and yeah. we'll be informed. Yeah, no doubt about that. Well, thanks for bringing it to our attention. We have some homework to do, and we'll be in touch in short order. We're meeting every other week, so we won't likely have anything on our docket this coming week, but maybe the following. Okay? Thanks so much. We Thank really you. appreciate thanks so much. Your, your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks seeing you guys again. Theo? A little bit. A little bit. Nice to see you again, Dale. Oh, yeah. You can walk us. We're going to skip over yep. town aggregation. Sherry, do you have any updates? I do. Okay. Um, so the manhole construction on School Street is complete. Um, and will be, that's one part of the ADA project, and the other part is the um, design for School Street, yep. the conceptual design. We'll be having uh, a meeting Wednesday night at 6 o'clock of the working group, and Berkshire Design is going to present conceptual designs at that time. Um, I believe he said he has three designs that we can look at and talk um, about. He's looking for input from all the stakeholders. Um, and anyone interested, and then we'll schedule a public meeting um, probably after he goes back and does some more revisions, depending on what he gets for input from that meeting. Um, and then we'll schedule a meeting uh, with the board and the public for uh, more input uh, later this summer. Sure, the design components are guidelined out by the grant, correct? Yes. Okay. This isn't just... What could possibly, this isn't the visioning process. This is engineering based on a set of standards in a, in a, de, in a defined area. Right. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, last week, last Thursday, we had the final walkthrough for the Riverside Park project. Mm -hmm. And so there's a few uh, punch list items um, that need to be taken care of. Um, and what we're needing to look at now is um, maintenance. Mm -hmm of the park and the fields and um, mowing and all of those things. I would like to reach out to um, various groups in town to see if we can generate some interest in a recreation committee. We really could do some help um, with all of those things um, and also with looking at opportunities for uh, programming and for um, continued um, maintenance and operation and just all of those things that go along um, with the park and sharing the rec fields with the park and all of it being one thing now instead of two. Um, so I'd like to reach out to um, the Pathways Committee, um, the Youth Baseball, um, the school, mm -hmm. and perhaps somebody from the select board. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and just residents at large that might be interested and see if we can get a group together to kind of help us manage all of uh, the things that are going on at the park in the rec field. Also, another important piece of that is um, a rec person sits on the CPA committee. Right. And so it's important to have somebody that can represent all those interests and help sure. us prioritize funding and projects and all of those things. So. Um, I'm hoping that the Riverside Park um, will generate interest in uh, long-term recreational 
opportunities for the town. Um, so with the board's uh, permission, we do have it posted on the website. I'd just like to do a little more outreach to see if, if I can generate some interest in. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, I was going to try to come up with a draft charge. I looked in the files to see if we had anything. I found some old minutes from 2011, and mm -hmm. but no real charge or anything. Framework. Okay. So maybe we could work on uh, on that as well. Even if that the town Riverside Park wasn't necessarily completely visioned out by 2011, so it's, yeah. even that is dynamic. But if it's a, if it's a starting point, that makes perfect sense. Okay. Right. Um, the other. Th thing that I have is the North Main Street uh, project. John Morgan will be here on August 26th at 630 uh, to present the bird's eye pedestrian view of the design exception. Um, and that's it. That's all I have. Tom, anything from Slackman's updates? Um, I'm, I'm going to hold on till our next meeting. We'll talk about seniors because it's a lengthy <laughs> senior center. Okay. Uh, obviously, we talked earlier about the film permit we acted on last week. That work is done. There's a capital planning committee meeting last week as well, uh, specific to, well, the totality of the report from Roy Brown and the impact on buildings and the beginning of the discussion. But Cherry had uh, specifically asked for uh, the committee's input on project specific to the ADA review because of a grant round that opens August 1st and closes October 1st and we want to be in that want to be in that queue uh, so the committee met and uh, prioritized some projects I was I was happy uh, and to Peter Gagarin's credit I want to thank him he invited uh, the su school superintendent and the elementary school uh, principal over uh, they participated in the first phase of the meeting centered around areas uh, for that would impact the elementary school that were in the ADA report and to see if there was a way of including elements of the proposed preschool playground in the ADA report although it's it's mentioned uh, there were there was after discussion uh, reprioritizing away from that primarily because of the date specific nature of the grant and how to coordinate that with any kind of playground construction frankly that's not approved yet so hmm. didn't make any sense that said i applaud their effort for coming forward and peter's effort for reaching out to them and and uh, bringing them in it was a very good discussion uh, and that was that was last week and that's all i have oh, with that scott too roy brown's coming out on thursday wednesday wednesday to take a look at right. those to provide cost so there was, estimates there were some elements inside of the building of uh, the elementary school that were uh, called out and the grant requires cost estimates and so we asked sherry suggested and asked uh, the architect who did the building survey to provide some of those estimates so i'll be able to Good. plug those in okay that's all i have there we have a uh, uh, town center committee charge tom there's three versions in front of us david's seen these we haven't i think you were you were away or you were unavailable if you look at them, the lengthiest is three. I, I marked mine anyway. Lengthiest is three. Uh, the middle one is two, and the, the shortest one is one. The history there is version one was a straw man that was put out by our office. Uh, the second was the beginning of some consensus work. And then the, the last one, the lengthiest one, uh, included language suggested by uh, stakeholders up and down uh, Main Street. Um, don't know about the appointment process. There are a couple of there are a couple of language pieces inside of the uh, need for a consultant on the third version, and that was an area of discussion when David was here, um, and I thought it was important you get a get a look at these. If you want to postpone action until David's here, you can canoodle over them and yeah. All right. I, I don't think that's a problem. Okay. So we'll postpone adoption and we'll wait for a full board and they'll give you a chance to drill down on them. Mm. Okay. There was another suggestion of changing the name to um, Village Center Committee to more Correct. align with the town bylaws. Um, to so on. Village Center Committee. 
That's fair. Thanks, Sherry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll have that up for our next meeting. And I'm thinking that's kind of it. So we're due back here at the 26th? No. The 12th. 12th. He's coming the 26th. We'll be back here on the 12th. FCAT, anything else I missed? Anything else we should talk about? I don't think so. <laughs> All right. Just thought I'd ask. Tom, anything? So I, I just want to reiterate the, uh, the change in the, at the center of town on the uh, no turn on red. I mean, it may take, it, it may be, it will be inconvenience for some, um, but please understand it was done after the state looked at the accident records um, and, and they were of sufficient number that they um, took this action. Predicated, so everybody knows, is that the, the state has identified that in, intersection as a troublesome intersection and they are looking at doing something in the very near future with that intersection as well, changing it, configurations. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that, that are going into it. So again, I mean, please understand there is no turn on reds at the center of town, the 11647, and it was done after the state looked at the records um, of, of, of the accidents um, vehicle versus pedestrian vehicle versus uh, bicycles and vehicle versus vehicles and it warranted the uh, change to no turn on red um, so just be careful there the state will be in after Labor Day we're in the process of coordinating a meeting to talk about what options might Good. be available excellent thank you motion uh, I'll accept the motion to adjourn second all those in favor? Aye. Call us out at 822.